So Philippians 1, 27. Last time we looked at Paul saying, only let your manner of life be worthy of the Gospel of Christ. And we stopped right there. And in that, we saw Paul is saying, only let your manner of life, your, your citizenship on earth, be worthy of your heavenly citizenship that you have in heaven. As he says in 3.20, our citizenship is in heaven. And we were reminded that us as Christians, we are citizens of heaven. And we represent our King. And is our life worthy of that? Our decisions. Can we say that what I am doing, how I am living, how I am conducting myself in this crooked and perverted generation is worthy of the Gospel? It is worth Christ dying as my substitute and putting away my sins. We thought about how citizens of specific countries have reputations. And I mentioned growing up, I would picture a citizen of China is smart with a high IQ. Now that's not accurate. Not all Chinese people fit that description. But citizens of Christ, of heaven, they do have characteristics that they will all have to some degree. And this morning, we're going to look at the fact that a person who's living a life worthy of the Gospel, a person who is a heavenly citizen, one of these characteristics that they're going to have is they're going to be living and striving to live a life of unity with other true Christians. So that's what we're going to tackle today. We're going to look at standing firm with one common purpose and unity for the advancement of the Gospel. And that is a characteristic of a heavenly citizen. Now, let's look at Philippians 1, 27. Paul goes on here to say, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you. That you are standing firm. And we're going to focus on this section. Standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the Gospel. Now, in context here, Paul is concerned for the church at Philippi. And he's concerned that they would be steadfast. We see that when he says the term stand firm. And we, he's concerned that they would have unity in the face of opposition. Where do we see opposition? Look at verse 28. And not frightened in anything by your opponents. So they have opponents. And Paul doesn't want them frightened by their opponents. He doesn't want them to lack unity in the midst of opponents. And Paul's concerned how they stand steadfast in unity in the midst of suffering. We find suffering in verse uh, 29. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in Him, but also suffer. So you at Philippi, you at Grace Community, you're going to suffer for His sake. And Paul says in verse 30, you're just engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had. And I still have this conflict of suffering, engaging in this. So, that's Paul's concern. How do we, do we maintain unity and steadfastness in the midst of suffering, in the midst of opposition? How do we handle that? And even when I was sitting back there this morning, I, I thought of the rain coming. And notice what the rain has done in the building. It has exposed some weak points in the roof. We have a leak right there we did not know about. I think there's a leak back there. we got a bucket there. I didn't know that leak existed before the opposition of this storm came last night, today, this whole last week. And now it's made us aware. We have a leak right there, and we have a leak right there. In the same way, Paul knows that when a storm in the spiritual realm comes, what happens? You're going to start seeing things exposed. Even in our church, when the storm comes, you see where maybe was disunity at that we didn't see before. Where are people not handling suffering right where we didn't see before? And a storm coming helps expose these things. And that's what's happening not only in Philippi, but Paul is writing from prison. Paul is in the midst of a storm himself. So as we go through this, here's some things to really think about. If we fail, and this is Paul's thrust in this letter. He's talking about advancing the Gospel, progressing the Gospel. It's all about the Gospel. If we lose unity, we fail at our goal of advancing the Gospel. 
If we fail when we face opposition, guess what we're going to fail at? Advancing the Gospel. When you fail against opposition as a Christian, it's not just, oh, I failed in how I was being opposed, but you fail in advancing the Gospel. And if we don't handle our suffering right, we fail to advance the Gospel. So Paul says in verse 27, that I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one Spirit. And here's something to think about today. What can be heard of you? What could Paul say, this is what I hear of you? And that's for all of us. Something could be heard in regards to every single one of us. And what is that? What, what do they hear of me? James Jennings. What do they hear of Grace Community Church? So the first thing I want to look at before we uh, get into this, this, these phrases right here is what is our goal? As we think about unity, as we think about these things, what is the driving goal and the driving purpose? And I believe we find that here right at the end of verse 27. Paul says here, I may hear of you that you're standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side. We're going to look at all that. But then he says, for the faith of the Gospel. So Paul, Paul's goal here is that we would be striving for the faith of the Gospel. And he doesn't say a faith, but he says the faith. Because that's what we have as Christians. We have the only true doctrine the only true faith the only way to heaven we don't have a door we have the door and paul says the faith or you could you know the faith of the gospel it sounds kind of what are you trying to say paul paul's point is it's the faith contained in the good news of christ's life and death what's contained in the gospel it's this message of jesus christ he's god he came from heaven as a man he lived a perfect life the gospel that's what that's what we're fighting for. We know as Jeff pointed out last week in the book of Jude, he says, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints. So there is this, the faith. And that is our goal for all of this. You know, we aren't, we aren't seeking to strive side by side and to have unity without a purpose. Right? I mean, we're not here as a church without a purpose. We're here for the faith of the Gospel. We're here to advance, to defend, to confirm the Gospel. Those are all words Paul has used leading up to this point. That's his thrust to this church at Philippi. And that's where we're at as grace community. We see in Philippians 1.5, Paul says here, because of your partnership, your fellowship in the Gospel from the first day until now. This is an ongoing thing. We see in 1.7, Paul says here, in my imprisonment and in the defense and the confirmation of the Gospel. So it's about defending and confirming the Gospel. We see in 1.12, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the Gospel. So Paul's about fellowship in the Gospel. Confirming, defending, advancing the Gospel of Jesus Christ. What Christ has done on the cross and putting away our sins. And even look at 125. Paul says here, why am I going to remain? I know I'll remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. Same thing we find right later in 27. The faith. So Paul's whole life is about the Gospel of Jesus Christ. That's our goal. We, we, we're not going to look at this thing of unity today as being worthy of the Gospel of Christ other than the fact that we want more unity so we can better advance the Gospel of Jesus Christ. That's our goal. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9.23, he said, I do it all for the sake of the Gospel. That's Paul's attitude. Everything in his life, becoming all things that he might win some, didn't have you know, some personal conviction. It was about the Gospel. That was the issue. We know in Acts 20:24, 20, Paul said he did not count his life of any value if only one thing that he would testify of the gospel of the grace of God. So Paul is all about the gospel. And Paul 
is a man who we just read in verse 21 said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And again, a person who's living as Christ lived, who's living for Christ, with Christ as their motivator, that's going to be the motivating thing in their life. I want the Gospel to be defended. I'm going to contend for it. I want it to advance. I want it to be confirmed in this church's life. That's the Christian life. It's all about the Gospel. So, why does that matter? That's our goal. Our, our goal is not supremely abortion ministry. Our goal is not supremely all these other Things. Those are can be obviously motivated by the Gospel. We want to help save unborn children. But that's not the thrust of the church. That's not the thrust of what unifies us. It's not partnership in abortion ministry. Just like the Catholics want to partner with us in that. No, because they have a different Gospel. So, it's not... Uh, our main thing unifying us is not our outreach to the poor in the physical sense. It's our outreach to those who are poor spiritually and have not their eternal souls saved. So, first thought, our goal as Christians, our goal as a church, is, as Paul says right here in verse 27, it is for the faith of the Gospel. That is the motivator thing. That's why Paul wants our lives to be worthy and that's what a life worthy of the Gospel is. It's a life lived for the Gospel. And again, the good news. The Gospel means good news. It's the good news of our sins being put away. The wrath due to us. The penalty we deserve being satisfied by our substitute, Jesus Christ, who took our wrath in our place on the cross and rose from the dead. So, is your life for the Gospel for Christ? That is a life worthy of the Gospel. That's a life saying for me to live as Christ. So does Paul hear of those at Philippi or those of GCC that this is so? Now let's, let's go in and look at verse 27. We're going to start here by looking at Paul. He, he says here, I may hear of you that you are standing firm. Standing firm. You think about that word firm. It means you're, you're not yielding. Not yielding to error. Not yielding to disunity. Think about firm. Another word could be the word solid. You know how we say that church is a solid church. What do we mean? That church is a firm church. They're firm on the Bible. They're firm on doctrine. They're firm on their life being there. They're firm in standing on the faith. You think about standing firm. One person I think about is John MacArthur and his Larry King Live interviews. I mean, if you watch John MacArthur on Larry King, you, you leave watching those little clips thinking, wow, he really stood firm. I mean, that guy did not waver. He did not yield. He stood firm. Standing firm. You know, you think about the opposite of firm. It's wavering. Wavering is a shameful thing. Even in the book of James, it talks about a double-minded man. He's praying one thing, he's praying another, but he just doesn't really believe. He's just wavering in his faith. We think about Hebrews 10. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Psalms 26. He prayed, Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity and I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. So you think about not standing firm. It's going from firmness to wavering. And Paul, he's saying, I want to come and hear of you that you're standing firm. That you're not wavering. Above all, in the faith of the Gospel. We're going to look at, he's hitting on here, is unity. So, this idea of standing firm, it's all throughout the New Testament. Even later in Philippians 4.1, Paul says to them there, Therefore, my beloved brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord. Stand firm. He says in 2 Thessalonians 2, So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught us. You think of someone who doesn't stand firm, they're not holding fast to the apostles' teaching. Think of Galatians 5.1, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. You think about those who go back to Moses for sanctification, for justification. They're not standing firm. Firm. 
1 Thessalonians 3.8 For now we live if you are standing fast in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 16 Be watchful, stand firm in the faith. Act like men, be strong. So Paul, he says, when I come to GCC, am I going to hear of them that they're standing firm? Standing firm. Wavering? Standing firm. Yielding to everything, you know, to the world, to the, the, you know, the carnal logic, let's do this, we'll get a bigger church, all these things. Or are we standing firm? So, next point. Paul, he's worried about are we standing firm despite who is watching? And I get the who is watching from what he said right before. Let's read verse 27 again. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the Gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the Gospel. Paul does not want his presence to be a determining factor on whether we're standing firm or not. He doesn't want that. Whether I'm there, whether I'm not. Whether I'm in prison, whether I die. Whether you're out of prison, I don't want that to be a determining factor on your firmness, on your unity, on how you handle opposition and suffering. We need to be motivated by a fear of God. Right? I mean, it is sad when we can fear man more than God. What did Isaiah say? He said, stop regarding man in whose nostrils is mere breath. For what, of what account is man? Ultimately, we're going to give an account to God. He's going to judge the secrets of our hearts. And Matthew 10 says, do not fear man who can kill your body, but fear God who can kill the body and both throw into hell. You know, I thought about when I was in school, I, sometimes I would study best when the teacher was in the classroom because I felt the pressure. They're watching. But Paul's saying, I don't want that to be the case. Whether I'm absent or not, your standing firm cannot be based on whether I'm there or not. So, standing firm despite who is watching. Now, we're talking about standing firm. This idea not wavering. Not, not uh, falling into... Not yielding. Not doing it just because who's watching. And what's the big thing Paul wants us to stand firm in? He says, stand firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the goal of the faith of the Gospel. And as we already saw, his big thing is advancing, confirming, defending the Gospel of Jesus Christ. So, next we're looking at what he says here. In one spirit with one mind. In one spirit with one mind. Now as I studied this, the first question I had to ask is this. Is the one Spirit right here, is it just, Paul's just saying in one Spirit with one mind, and it's just the same way of referring to one mind, he's just saying it in two different ways, but the thrust of is it the same thing? Or does the one Spirit there refer to the Holy Spirit? Now I've, I have, I'm undecided now after reading Gordon Fee's commentary. I'd always taken it to mean one Spirit, not the Holy Spirit. But I don't have time to dive all into all this in this lesson right here. But if you want a good study, read Gordon Fee's commentary on Philippians. He gives some very convincing arguments that maybe it could be referring to the Holy Spirit. Now this is the thing. If someone took that, this is the one thing you get from that. As, as Fee said, if it is referring to the Holy Spirit, Fee says this, he says you should qualify the Spirit as the One Spirit, the Holy Spirit. This emphasizes the source of their unity. Only by standing firm in the One and Only Spirit can they hope to contend as one person for the Gospel against their opposition. And he gives four reasons. Now, whether Fee is right, whether this is the Holy Spirit, or whether it is One Spirit, One Mind, the same, same thing as we're going to look at in a minute. Either way, we know from other places in the Scripture the only way we're going to have unity is by the power of the Spirit. And the only way we're in Christ is because the Spirit has made us one with the Lord. And so I don't feel like we should take 20 minutes to dive into that because whether it is or it isn't, we know from other places we need the Spirit's power. And we know 
as 1 Corinthians 12 says, these gifts are empowered by one and the same Spirit. And we know from Philippians 2.1, Paul goes on right after this to say, if anyone has any fellowship, participation in the Spirit. And so we know we need to have fellowship with the Holy Spirit. We need to be in the Spirit for this unity to be possible. And without having the Holy Spirit, we're not going to have a source and an ability to have unity. That's just not going to be there. So, is it just two different ways? One Spirit, one mind? Or is He referring to the Holy Spirit? Like I said, I, after reading Gordon Fee, found myself, his arguments were pretty convincing. But whether it is or it isn't, the fact is we need the Spirit's power. So let's, let's go on. And I'm sorry to do that. I, just, I was studying this and I ended up about having a whole sermon on the one Spirit. And I thought, you know what, that's not the thrust of the text. And I don't want to get lost in that. So, Paul says, with one firm in one Spirit, with one mind. And I want to look at that one mind. And if, if the one Spirit isn't referring to the Holy Spirit, what we're getting in the one mind is very similar. And so, we're, gonna, we're tackling that anyways. What is he saying here? With one mind. Now, if you look at this, you say, okay, well, Paul has the word mind right there in 27. And we, we go on to find it even later on. He says, have this mind among yourselves. Having the same mind. We find it throughout the passage, but there's a difference with that word mind there in 27. In, in the original, in the Greek, it means psych, psych, which is translated soul or life. And so Paul, Paul here is thrusting at something a lot more deeper than what we would think when we hear with one mind. When we think of one mind, sometimes you think you know similar thoughts. Now he's, he's saying that, yes. Yes, there's a common thing there. But he's saying it's deeper than that. It's having one person. It's having one life. It's having one soul. When he says, with one mind. Now what is Paul's point of, of, of using that Greek word? He wants to show us the thrust of this unity. This is really, really deep. And a great place we see this played out is in Acts 4.32. I'll just read that. It says, "...the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul." And that's the word. One heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to Him was His own but they had everything in common. You hear that? Everything in common. So when Paul's saying here, stand firm in one mind, in one soul, that's the thrust of what he's saying. He's saying stand firm with one heart. He's saying stand, stand firm with one soul. Everything in common. I mean, that is unity. That's the word that comes to my mind. He is, he is saying stand firm in unity. And that's how deep the level is. You're willing to give your life for each other. We know in John 17, it says, "...the glory that You have given Me, I have given to them, that they may be one." That they may be one, even as we are one. And Paul is saying here, stand firm in one Spirit with one soul, with one life. Us as a body. One life. Striving side by side for the faith of the Gospel. You see the attitude of Christians who are of one soul with some verses. <clears throat> Even Philippians 2.30, we see this same word, for He nearly died for the work of Christ, risking His life to complete what was lacking in your service to Me. Risking His life. That's what Paul is talking about. He says in Romans 16, Pris Prisca and Aquila risk their necks for Paul's soul. Risk their necks for Paul's soul. 2 Corinthians 12, Paul was giving his life for their souls. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 8, So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the Gospel of God, but also our own selves. And it's that word, soul. Our own soul. 
because you had become very dear for, to us. Dear to us. So those are examples of that word, of that attitude that Paul is speaking of here. So when you read one mind, think one soul, one life, one person sacrificing yourself for someone else. It's not just, oh, me and that guy are kind of like-minded. We think the same way. He's got the same doctrine. It's much, much deeper than that. You can have people you think the same way and have the same doctrine, and yet it's not, you're not living this one life. You're not having that deep, deep unity that Paul's referring to there. That's what he wants us standing firm in. It's not just stand firm in the same doctrine, but stand firm together in one life as one person for the advancement of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you are doing that, you're going to risk your soul for others. As we see in these other verses. Very clear. So, to have one mind, one soul, is to have a common purpose. And as we looked at, that common purpose is right there already. It's for the faith of the Gospel. Advancing the Gospel. You know, if we don't have that, that affects our defending the Gospel, our confirming the Gospel, our advancing the Gospel. Just like Jesus said that they may see we're one. If they don't see we're one, then what happens? That affects the Gospel advancing. When they see us as one, willing to risk our lives for each other, they look and they see something. That's, something's real there. And Paul even goes on to say that in verse 28. He says here, if we're not, not frightened in anything by their opponents, this. Now, the, the this there is not just referring to not being frightened by our opponents, but it's referring to the standing firm in unity. He says, this, standing firm in unity, this fearlessness is a sign to them, our opponents, of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. You know, if someone came in here and they don't see us as one person, one life, one soul risking our lives for one another, that, that's not going to put fear in them. That wow, what you, we have is real. But when they come in and they see that reality, wow, those people are standing firm as one life, one soul, one person for the faith of the Gospel. Not all these side issues, but that's their main desire. The world looks on that and they see, I've got destruction. Whatever they have is real. They have salvation. Because the only way that all these dividing walls could be broken down and all these people from different backgrounds could be brought together is through the Gospel of Jesus Christ. So, it's important to have unity because it, it, it deals with our advancing the Gospel. So, does Paul hear of you? Remember, Paul's saying, I want to hear of you. What does Paul hear of you? Does Paul hear of you standing firm with one soul with a common purpose? Does Paul hear of that? Does Paul hear that of me? And then he goes on to say, striving side by side for the faith of the Gospel. Let's think of that. Striving side by side. A commentator, Stephen Cole, he said, the picture, this word striving, this side by side, is of an athletic team working in cooperation and coordination toward a common goal. I tell you, to have a church with one life, one soul, to be a team of believers with one goal, not to, to win some trophy championship in the world, but to follow Christ, to see men saved. We, we don't have room for ball hogs, if you know what that is. We don't have room for pride. We need team players. And that's what unity promotes. Unity promotes the arm being the arm, the head being the head, the foot being the foot. That's, as Stephen Cole says, we're an athletic team working in cooperation. And he's, it says right here the term side by side. You think about side by side, that not far off and far off, but side by side, not arm's length. Well, they're far away from me. I can't get along with them. But side by side with them. Just like the linemen in the football game. You've got all these guys side by side. If you've got one of the linemen, he just pulls back. The offense gets in there, or the defense gets in there, and they sack the quarterback. We need to be side by side. 
Don't strive against, don't push away, but strive with and get closer. You know, when we think of striving, so often we think of strife. We think of disunity. We need to be doing the opposite of that. Striving side by side together. And again, this is for the Gospel. Paul said in Colossians 1, he said, Christ we proclaim. And then he goes on to say, for this I toil, struggling with all His energy that He powerfully works within me. And it's God working in us as Paul goes on in Philippians 2 to will and to work for His good pleasure. That's the only way we can do this is God's power at work in us. And Paul says, this is why I toil. This is my life. I mean, is that your life? To live is Christ. My life is about advancing the Gospel. It's about being in unity for the faith of the Gospel. Something much bigger than myself. It's about the good news of Jesus Christ's death for sinners. I mean, that is a great cause to strive to be side by side, to fight for unity, to fight to contend for the Gospel. And that word striving in other places is even rendered as contend. We must contend for the faith. Again, the Jude, verse 3, appealing to you to contend for the faith. To contend. So a life worthy of the Gospel is a life striving for and contending for this Gospel side by side together. Don't think of the Christian life as just a life where you're just striving to get the Gospel out. Don't miss unity. Don't miss the church. You don't want you know what the Lone Ranger attitude. I'm just out there by myself. That may seem super spiritual, but I mean, we found it time and time through the internet, the people who cannot be part of a local body of church is because they're conceited and full of pride and they're unwilling to love people. And they, can't, they don't want to strive for unity. They want to strive to uphold their own convictions, not for the faith of the Gospel, and then they just divide. Paul is saying, oh. So, as we close, let's think of some, some applications here. Specifically. Again, let's read verse 27. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So whether I come and see you or am absent, doesn't matter who's watching you, that I may hear of you, Grace Community, Philippi, that you are standing firm, not wavering, and you're standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, one soul, one life, one life, striving side by side for the faith of the Gospel. One common purpose unified for the faith of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news of Christ's death. So, if, if the thing here that I'm trying to bring out that look, only uh, we just looked at last time, that a, we want to live a life in a manner worthy of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. And one of the characteristics of a heavenly citizen someone who's living in a manner worthy of the Gospel of Christ, is that they're striving to have one soul, one mind, be side by side to be unified. That's a characteristic of someone living in the manner worthy of the Gospel of Christ. Okay, That's, that's something the good news does to you. It changes your heart. You want unity. You want the brethren. You love other Christians. Jesus said, who are my brothers and sisters? Those who do the will of my Father in heaven. You are my brothers and sisters, my mothers, my daughters. So, why disunity and not one soul? First, My first reason is a lack of communication. And where I get this in the text is from the whole book. Paul is writing a letter to a church exhorting them on these things. Clearly, there was something not entirely unified as he had hoped. What did Paul do? He communicated. And one of the biggest things to promote unity, to strive to be side by side, is to open our mouths and to communicate to one another. Because Satan wants us to hold things in, to not communicate, and the devil just slanders us all day long. We assume a million wrong things that aren't true because we fail to communicate. We're frightened. So Paul, he communicated. He communicated. He, he knew your adversary, as Peter said, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him firm in your faith. So why disunity? Why not one soul? A lot of times it's a lack of communication. And Paul is communicating via this letter. 
And we're going to see that Philippians 4. Turn there briefly. Why, why disunity? As he already hit on, disunity because people cannot agree. Now you see right here in Philippians 4, uh, 2. I entreat Eodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. And that, that could be rendered right there to have the same mind. To be in harmony. That's what he's saying. Have the same mind. Be in harmony. Agree in the Lord. Have the same mind in the Lord. Right there. Now look what he goes on to say. Verse 3, Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the Gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. So he's entreating two people who have labored side by side together with him in the Gospel. What's the point? There are people we have labored side by side together with in the Gospel. And guess what? Sometimes we've got to write them and we've got to entreat them to agree and we've got to get them to have unity. You can lose unity. And you've got to maintain unity. And even if you have unity with them, they don't have unity together. And Paul's writing to them saying, you guys need to have the same mind. You need to agree in the Lord. And here they've labored side by side in the Gospel together. They've got the right goal, right? For the Gospel. So, the New King James in that verse says, I implore Eodia, I implore Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. So that brings another thing. I was thinking of Ephesians 4. It's not in the book of Philippians, but Ephesians 4 says, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Here, a reason is a lack of one soul at times and a lack of unity. We don't do proper maintenance. We're not eager to maintain unity. Unity is something you can have and you can lose. You can seek to maintain it. I mean, just like your car, you maintain the oil. You have to get new oil. You have to do maintenance. You have to do maintenance on your house. Your house doesn't just sit there and stay perfect. It, de it decays. Things happen. And you've got to maintain it. You've got to keep on top of things. That's the same thing with all of our relationships. It's not just, wow, I had a great relationship with so-and-so three years ago and we were one soul for the faith of the Gospel and we were striving side by side together for the faith of the Gospel. Do I have that three years later? Am I doing maintenance? And again, Paul is doing maintenance here even in this letter in the things he says in chapter 1 to the church at Philippi and in chapter 4 to these two women. So, am I... Unified in my one soul with you right now in the present, not just back then. Am I doing proper maintenance? So why, another reason, why not one soul? Why disunity? Verse 17, we already looked at this weeks, months ago. Verse 17, Paul talks about some here proclaim Christ. They're preaching Christ. But look at their motive out of selfish ambition. Not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. Chapter 2, verse 3 says the same thing. Do nothing from selfish ambition. We find this idea of selfish ambition. And that's, that's a big reason we can have disunity. Selfish ambition is insincere motives. Insincere motives cause disunity. Selfish motives cause disunity. In it for ourselves. Not ultimately for the faith of the Gospel. Not advancing the Gospel, but advancing ourselves. And that can happen in a whole lot of subtle ways. So, disunity can happen because selfish ambition. He says right here in 2.3, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. What's the opposite of conceit? Having humility. And what's one way disunity happens? Conceit. Self-esteem. Bunch of pride. Many can't get along because too proud. I mean, you look at the times, you're one soul. And then something happened and you're not. I mean, what is it? Even in marriage. You think of the marriage relationship. Why is it? There's sin. It comes in. And sometimes it's pride. Unwilling to humble. I'm wrong. You're right. Conceited. Thinking too high of ourselves. Too high of our own thoughts. That causes disunity. 
Disunity happens because we aren't willing to do what Christ did. In verse 7 of chapter 2, He took the form of a servant. Disunity happens because we can be unwilling to serve. We want to be served. Or we want to serve in a certain way. And Christ is our example. That's what we're going to look at weeks from now. Christ came down and He took the form of a servant. You want to have one soul in unity? Take the form of a servant. Lay aside your pride. Lay aside conceit. Take the form of a servant. Another thing that brings on disunity, and I'm reading from chapter 2 a lot because Paul, Paul just goes on here. I mean, a lot of commentators say take that chapter 2 mark and remove it from your Bible because he just goes on here. They don't know why there's a chapter break because he is going on here laboring, dealing with their affairs, and then he gets back to his affairs later on Verse around verse 17-18. So, Paul, Paul says here, uh, where was I going? Oh, verse 14. Here another issue is that promotes disunity. Grumbling or disputing. Here he says, do all things without grumbling or disputing. When you think about Israel, they were murmuring. Murmuring. Grumbling. Disputing. That can promote disunity. I mean, we know that from experience, even in our own hearts. Sometimes it's not even outwardly expressed. We just feel lack of unity because some grumbling in our own hearts that we didn't mortify, shoot down quick enough. So, disunity is not worthy of the gospel among those truly saved. You know, brothers and sisters, we don't want family tensions unresolved. We're all going to be in heaven. Mac Tomlinson uh, preached a sermon a while back called Having Every Relationship Right. It was a glorious, glorious uh, sermon. I had, I had uh, sinned against someone two years earlier in my heart. I would said something to them too harsh. Two years earlier, and my conscience was never clear. And they didn't even go to this church. And Mac Tomlinson is preaching that sermon on having every relationship right. And that person was visiting that day sitting in front of me. I had sinned two years earlier. And obviously I was using my excuses. Well, it happened a long time ago. And right after I said that, Max says in the sermon, and you'll try to excuse it and say it happened a long time ago. I was like, oh no! Stop! Stop! And then the sermon ended and I knew. I mean, God's hand was heavy upon me. Psalms 32 and I had to talk to the guy. It didn't matter two years earlier. I didn't have unity with him. I wasn't one soul with him. It was the farthest thing from the truth. And I had to talk. Unify. That's taking the form of a servant. Now we know all this talk of unity just briefly. We know 1 Corinthians 11, Paul says there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. Again, if someone doesn't have the Holy Spirit and they're not born again and they're not of the one Spirit, as it says in Ephesians, guess what? It's going to be pretty difficult to have unity with someone who's lost. And you can strive for it and not get that. And there's going to be division to show who's true and false. So quickly... As we did, I just skip a. Okay, here it is. So quickly as we close, the fruits of unity. I want to end not on how, not on a note of uh, different things that cause disunity. We need to think about those. Why do I not feel with certain people? If you do, maybe no one feels that. But if you do have a sense that you're not one soul, why is that? So, fruits of unity. If, you're, if we're unified, guess what we're going to see happening? Chapter 1, verse 3. We're going to be praying, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy. My prayer with joy. We're going to look at verse 7 in chapter 1. We're going to say, I hold you in my heart. I hold you in my heart. We're going to look at verse 8. And say, God is my witness. God can testify. He sees in my heart how I yearn and burn for you all with the affection, the love of Jesus Christ, His sacrificial death. I have that same love for you. We're going to be able to say, like verse 25, this is, this is one soul talk right here. I'm convinced of this. I know I will remain and continue with you all not by myself, with you all, for your progress and joy in the faith. 
I'm, I'm going to remain. I'm not going to depart and be with Christ. I'm going to remain for you. Yes, for the faith. The progress of the faith. But that big thing of the progress of the faith is the church. That's why we need a unified church. And we have a unified church, but we need to strive for more unity. We need to strive for more oneness. We need to strive more to be one soul. Who can say we've reached that as, as we need it? And here another big reason, uh, fruit of unity. A glorious one. Paul says here in chapter 2, verse 2, or he goes on, participation in the Spirit and affection and sympathy. And look what he says, complete my joy by being of the same mind. You know one thing that you get from having unity? You have complete joy. Who wants complete joy? I do. And what's one of the things that doesn't complete my joy at times? It is not being one soul. It is disunity coming in in subtle ways, little things. And Paul here, this isn't just a fight for unity to advance the Gospel. It's, it's strive for unity to be side by side for the sake of your own joy as a Christian. I mean, Paul is all about joy in this letter. And here it's clear as day. Complete my joy by being of the same mind. Why unity? 2.15 Do all things without grumbling or disputing? That you may. Be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. And here, fruit of unity is we get to shine bright. And we want to shine brighter. We want to have a massive aura, a massive glow of the love of Christ. We want that to be seen to the world. That's a big reason to strive for unity. And this is a crooked world. By this all people will know that you are My disciples if you have love for one another. So, is your life for the faith of the Gospel? Ask yourself, is that my goal? Am I standing firm before God who is watching? Is that, is that how I'm, I'm living? I'm living because God is watching me. Whether Paul is absent or not is not the deal. Am I standing firm as one soul with a common purpose? The advancement of the Gospel. So why unity? For the goal and cause of the Gospel. Strive, strive for unity. This goes hand in hand with us as a church advancing the Gospel into the world. Unity. We need it. It's something worthy of those who are heavenly citizens. And it's something we need to advance the Gospel. We need more of it. We want to strive for it. We want to be side by side together. We want to be that team there on the court living for Christ, advancing His Gospel. And again, the Gospel is the good news of being brought into a right relationship with God through the death of His Son. And if we're brought into a right relationship with God and a fellowship with Christ, how much more should we have fellowship with one another? How much more? So let's pray. Father, pray You'd all the more help us, Lord, to only live a manner of life worthy of the Gospel of Christ. Lord, because You do see us, You hear of us, you, Your eyes run to and fro from the earth. Lord, help us to be of one soul, one life, one person. Lord, we're members of a body. Body. Lord, would You help us? Lord, You said in the Psalms how blessed is it when the brethren dwell in unity. And Lord, we, we, we have unity. At least that's my own sense. But Lord, I pray You'd give us more. Lord, more unity. Please. At deeper and deeper levels. Lord, not we don't, as it is said, we don't just want it in doctrine. We want that absolutely. But Lord, we want it deeper. And I pray You'd give more of that side by side together, Lord, for the sake of the Gospel, for the true faith, the only faith, for Your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, would You raise up laborers from this church and send them into the harvest that men might come to know You, the one true God. Just ask this in Christ's name. Amen.